So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Charles, and uh, at Line here, I'm part of the security development team. And the subject I want to talk to you about is one of our on ongoing projects, uh, which is regarding securing Line user backups. So, first a bit, I'll explain a bit about who I am. So, before joining Line, I used to work as a security consultant in Paris. What I was doing mainly was auditing software, cryptography, or hardware implementations for the company and helping them getting certifications or finding bugs and fixing vulnerabilities. And during that time, I was one of I was part of the team that wrote one of the first paper on breaking white box cryptographic implementations. And we wrote open source tools as well for that. And I also uh, wrote a reverse engineering uh, tool called QBDI, which is a dynamic binary instrumentation framework. And both of those, uh, and so it's basically oriented doing vulnerability research on mobile devices. And both of those uh, tools are available as open source on GitHub, if you want to take a look. The first thing I want to talk about is uh, the difference in security uh, between breaking and building. Uh, I'm a hacker, so I like breaking things. Uh, I find that, that it's really fun. But security is not about only about hacking and breaking things. It, it's also about building things. At the end of my first internship, where I was working on breaking white box uh, cryptographic implementation, uh, my colleague told me that I was really good at breaking stuff, and it was really nice, but maybe now I should try building things instead of breaking them. Because it's true, breaking things is much, much more easier and take way less time than actually building a secure code and secure implementation. Because if you want to break something, you only need to find a single vulnerability. But if you want to build something secure, you need to make sure that it is not a single vulnerability. So it's much harder work. Moreover, uh, breaking uh, an implementation only has a short-term impact. Because you will publish a vulnerability, and then the software vendor will make a patch for it, and then everybody will update, and then it's done. But if you build something secure, then you have a long-term impact. Because the, the code you write, the secure code you write, will be used for many years after. So that's why, although I'm a hacker and I like breaking things, I, I find that building things is much more rewarding as, a, as an individual. The next thing I want to talk about is security in a big company. Because the role of a security company, uh, security team in a security company is a bit blurry. Because ideally, you have security people, and so you want your security team to only focus on what they're good at, which is security. So if you want to integrate them into your uh, company flow, ideally, you just want them to design security mechanisms and security features and write the specifications and then hand over those specifications to the development team and have the development team implement it. And finally, once the software is done, then your security team can take a last look at it and try to find to verify that it matches specifications and it, there, that there is no vulnerability. And, and that's the ideal case. But in practice, it doesn't really happen that way. Because your development team, they have a knowledge gap between uh, the developer knowledge and your security team security knowledge. And because of that knowledge gap, they will misunderstand your specifications. Uh, and then that's not the only problem. They're a development team. So they have other priorities. They actually have to build a product and release a product and respect the deadline. And they will often lack the time to finish everything. So they will want to cut corners somewhere. And they will maybe try to cut corners in security features. But because they are not security experts, they might cut corners in the wrong places. Lastly, they are not security experts again. So they will make security mistakes. And sometimes the security mistakes is not their fault. It's simply they did a mistake which to the security team seems obvious. It was not supposed you were something you were supposed to do. And because it was obvious, the security team never precise it in the security specifications. So the development team misunderstood and, and made a mistake. 
so that, that's why at line we're trying to solve a bit this uh, problem. Uh, it both uh, goes back to my to, to our desire to build things instead of just breaking them, but also to trying to solve that problem. So the first idea is that uh, I, our security team would not only design things, but also develop security features. And this relieves the workload of the development team. And, and then, because it's difficult for multiple teams to collaborate on the same product and same code base, uh, we, 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 use, uh, we write them those features as modules and microservices, so it's easier for the development team to integrate those features. And finally, an advantage of our team is that we are integrated inside the security development, uh, the security department. So uh, we are daily, we are talking with other people handling abusing uh, risk management, risk analysis. So we are aware of the real security problem we are trying to solve for line users. So our team is quite young and has only been around for around six months. Uh, but this is an example of the kind of project we are working on. So uh, the first one uh, is a FIDO2 passwordless authentication, which is uh, maybe you've seen uh, Shinikian uh, talk earlier about it. So that's one of the things we do. Uh, so in that case, uh, one of our responsibilities was writing the FIDO2 authenticator as a module and providing it to the line pay team so the line pay development team could integrate that feature as a module inside line pay code. Uh, and it has been recently released. Uh, another one is a letter sealing E2E key backup project, and that's the subject of this talk. But we're also working a lot with uh, line banking projects and supporting those teams to because they face many security challenges. So first, I will briefly explain what letter sealing is. Uh, because I'm not sure everybody knows what it is. But in short, it's line implementation of an end-to-end -end encryption for user messages. So I'm really sorry, but we're going to go into a bit of cryptography. But line letter sealing is based on what is known as asymmetric cryptography, and more specifically, elliptic curve cryptography. So in an elliptic curve cryptography protocol, uh, each user uh, will generate an elliptic curve key pair, which is made of a public key and an associated private key. So the public key is public, so it's shared with line servers, with other line users, everybody knows it. But the private key uh, is confidential and stays inside the device. So when Alice wants to send a message to Bob in that example, they first have to do what is known as a key exchange. So they will exchange their respective public key. And then we, they use their own private key with the other device public key, and they do something known as uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman exchange. But in short, it will uh, derive a shared secret key, which is the same for both devices although the key in use are different in, in both cases. Uh, it's Alice public key with Bob private key and Bob public key with Alice private key, but it gives the same result. And that's the magic of the uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman uh, algorithm. So once you have these shared secrets between those two uh, users, uh, now you can use it uh, with symmetric cryptography, for example, AES, and you can use that to encrypt messages. So if, Bob, if Alice wants to send a message, she takes a message, the shared secret key, encrypt the message with the shared secret key, send it through line servers, and then Bob receives the encrypted message, but Bob has the same shared secret key, so he can simply decrypt the message. So that's how it works. So letter, that, that's letter sealing. Uh, well, line-specific implementation of this end-to-end -end cryptography protocol uh, is called letter sealing. And it has a few important principles. First of all is that uh, it's an asymmetric key exchange. So this means that from the network side, from the server side, all you see are public keys and encrypted messages. And because of the nature of elliptic curve and the elliptic curve problem, if you know the public key, you cannot rederive the private key. And even if you know both public key, you cannot compute the shared secret key. You need one of the public key and the other private key. Absolutely. 
So as a result, the message is what we call end-to-end -end encrypted, because the shared secret key is only loaded on both ends of the two devices. And it also means that for line servers, we're storing encrypted messages. And this is an advantage both for line users, because we can guarantee their privacy as from a security uh, and cryptography point of view, but it's also an advantage for Line itself because we're storing less confidential information, less sensitive information, so we, there is less risk for us. Now, letter sealing is really great, but this creates actually a problem for account migration, and I will explain that now. So let's just say that Alice buys a new device. So she goes onto a new device and she logs in into a line account and and then the line, the new device from the line servers can receive a few informations about her account like the profile pictures or the friend list that's information we have and we share but what she does what the server doesn't have is her private key the private key is only on the old device and the message also also has encrypted messages so Alice on a new device would probably want to see uh, old messages that the server has, but they are encrypted with a private key that the server doesn't have. And that's a property of line letter sealing. That's why line letter sealing is good, but it also means that Alice cannot read her old messages on her new device. So the question is how could we transfer that private key from the old device to the new device in a secure way? It's a harder problem uh, than it seems, and nearly none of the existing secure messaging applications have fully solved. Uh, I think one notable exception is Apple iMessage. So the, the first problem is we want something that works in case of broken or lost device. This means we want to assume that Alice doesn't have access to her old device anymore. So we cannot use any kind of interactive out-of-band communication using something like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or NFC to communicate between the old and the new device. This is not possible. The second problem is we want to work across platform. We want to allow users to uh, uh, switch from iOS to Android and from Android to iOS. Uh, and this means we cannot really rely on all the existing uh, platform-specific backup uh, mechanisms that exist, like iCloud or the Keychain or Google Cloud Backup. The last problem is we want to resist uh, something known as the insider threat model, uh, which I will explain. But end-to-end -end encryption protects against the insider threat model. So we want our backup mechanism to at least provide the same level of security as end-to-end -end encryption. So what is insider threat model? Well, in short, insider threat model is the assumption that the attacker is already inside the perimeter. There are two reasons why you would want to make this assumption. The first one is known as defense in depth. Uh, defense in depth is a design pattern for, for security architecture, which encourages the reliance on multiple layers of security. So if one of your layer fails, because there are other layers, they can still protect uh, your design. The second one is the insider thread model, and this is the assumption that the attacker is already inside. He already has privileged access. Uh, so in our system, uh, what an insider could be, uh, it could be anything from an attacker compromising line infrastructure, so he has access to line servers, a malicious line employee, or even maybe not a malicious line employee, but a compromised line employee. Uh, and lastly, that's also possible, is a state actor trying to compromise uh, the connection uh, between our line users and uh, our servers. Uh, so if they compromise the BGP DNS infrastructure and can make fake, uh, fake SSL TLS certificates, then the user is screwed, basically. So, what I want to show you is that actually finding a solution to this problem is not only a security problem, it's a compromise between user experience and security. Let's first talk about the best user experience. The best user experience, if, if the old device would store and save a private key onto line servers, 
uh, automatically, then when the new device logs in, the new device can simply download the private key and decrypt the messages, right? That's the best possible user experience you can get because it's entirely automatic, no user interaction required. It's magical, it just works. Uh, however, now we're transmitting the private key in, in the same secure channel, in the same parameter than the encrypted messages. So if anybody that has access to the encrypted messages, they also have access to the line, to the private key, so they can simply decrypt the messages. So it means we just completely compromise line letter sealing and we don't have any encryption anymore. And it's equivalent to no end-to-end -end encryption at all. And from a security point of view, that's not something we can accept. Now let's talk about the best security. So we like the idea of using line servers, uh, but we cannot store it, uh, store the, simply the private key, so maybe we should encrypt it. Um, if we want to encrypt it and make it secure, we need something, uh, a strong uh, encryption key, so a strong and complex password, uh, what I will refer as high entropy password. Uh, so also, because it's difficult to trust the user, we would securely generate that password and encrypt the key with it and store it on the servers. And then the new device can just download that encrypted key. The problem is now the user has to somehow save, generate, save this password and re-input it into the new device. So it's the best possible security because the private key is encrypted again with a high entropy complex password. Now the problem is uh, because the password has to be inputted into the new device, the user has to remember or write down the complex and long auto-generated password. And then it has to input it again and that's, we all know, it's a very error-prone process to input some random uh, series of letters and numbers. So it's the worst possible user experience we can get. So I want to make a small parenthesis why I uh, insisted on low entropy and user-generated and uh, auto-generated passwords. Well, it's because what I mean by entropy is uh, the number of possibilities you have in a password, in a, in a code. Very nice. So a low entropy m means you only have a small numbers of different passwords th that are used. For example, a six digit pins will only offer a million different com possibilities. But if we ask a user to choose a digit, a uh, six digit pin, it means six numbers. So we probably pick a birth date. So you can probably guess that the first two number, first two digits are in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, uh, that the s next two digits are between 1 and 12, and the next two digits are between 1 and 31. You will probably break a lot of pin this way. So it's not actually the full 1 million possibilities that are there. And you have exactly the same problem with passwords. Uh, when there was, a, there was a lot of uh, password database leaks and people did a lot of analysis on what kind of password users choose. And what they discovered is that if you use the 25 most common passwords, you can crack around 10% of user accounts. And that, that's really not much. And it's important in our use case, because in our use case, we are assuming that the attacker can access the encrypted private key. So he can download it offline and then put it in a lot of machines and can brute force the password in parallel. So 25 is of course nothing for a human, but a million is nothing for a computer. The la last thing is, as you can see, the user are tend to be bad at choosing and remembering complex passwords. So that's why we are motivated by the idea of auto-generating a password for the users if we want security. So if we summarize the problem, we end up with a compromise uh, over the entropy of the password. A lower entropy password would offer better user experience, uh, but worse security, while a high entropy password would offer better security, but bad user experience. And then we have a whole lot of bad compromise to choose from. Uh, one notable exception uh, is uh, word list based passwords. Uh, there is an XKCD about it, if you don't know. Uh, but the idea is to generate a password not using random letters, but using random words, because you, 
people are better at remembering words. Uh, so that works. That's used in practice by hardware cryptocurrency wallets uh, for the key backup of the, the cryptocurrency wallet. Uh, the problem is that if you want high entropy, then you need a lot of words, and then you end up with something very long that is, again, difficult for a user to write down, write down or remember. So, of course, this talk would be completely pointless if I would stop there and tell you there is no solutions. So I will now go over an actual way where you can secure low entropy secrets to enable better alternatives. So if we think about uh, low entropy secrets we use every day, uh, l l l just think for a second what kind of low entropy secrets you use every day. I think the funniest, but it's also a good analog example, is actually a combination padlock. Because it's only a four-digit pin, but because every time you want to make a try to unlock the padlock, you need to manipulate the hardware, every try is slow. So if you want to go over the 10,000 possibilities of your four-digit padlock, you need a lot of time. And also, because you need the hardware to do it, you cannot recruit a few friends and give the hardware to other people so you can try in parallel uh, different uh, numbers. Another more digital ex example is uh, a banking card with a chip. The chip is actually called a secure element, and for what good reasons is that it's hardware, specific hardware designed with only one purpose, protecting the user pin authentication. And because it's hardware running a special software, it can do a lot of things. For example, it enforces a maximum number of pin attempts. If you try too many wrong pin on your banking card, it will get blocked and you cannot use it anymore. And because the chip is used to sign the transaction you make, if the chip is locked, you cannot use it. Another example is a smartphone lock screen. Uh, whether you use a pin code, a pattern, or even biometric authentication. The authentication secret is actually stored into another hardware security mechanism. Uh, in, for high-end Android phone, that would be the ARM Trust Zone, but for uh, iPhone, that would be the Apple Secure Enclave. So the point of these uh, special uh, things called actually trusted execution environments is that they also run special secure software and they can also enforce a maximum attempt of unlocking the phone. And even because they have access to a clock, they can attempt, uh, en enable uh, authentication timeouts so that you're locked out of trying to unlock the phone for like 15 minutes if you fail too many times and that can really slow down an attacker trying to unlock your phone. So if we summarize all those uh, hardware solutions, they all rely on the same kind of uh, uh, mechanism, is that they store both some kind of attempt history and reference input, and, and then the attempt history could be something simple, like an uh, authentication counter so that you implement a lockout, but could be something more complex, like a timestamped attempt history so that you can uh, implement something like a timeout scheme. If the user is allowed to make a try uh, according to the attempt history, then the user input is compared to some kind of reference input stored inside the hardware, and the hardware protects that reference input. The secret answer that comes out uh, depends on the use case. So for a credit card, like I said, it's a, a, trans a signature of the transaction called a cryptogram. But for a smartphone lock screen, uh, it depends on the implementation, but sometimes it's something like a device encryption key. So you can only decrypt the, the phone data if you actually unlock the phone. So. Hardware has a lot of advantages, secure hardware, is that, first of all, it's isolated from the main system. It means it's, a much, it's not like a full operating system, it's a really smaller thing, and so it's, there's less code, there is less thing, and so it's much more easier to secure. It's a smaller attack surface. If you want to audit it, it takes less time. The next thing is that it's purpose-built. It's built for that. So it has a lot of countermeasures against physical attack included. Uh, you probably don't know, but uh, your banking card, you, the 
the, the chip, if you start probing in there, there is a lot of security mechanism that will actually wipe out the card. There is like light detectors and uh, uh, contact grids and things like that. And so they protect against disassembly, side channels, fault injection. The next advantage is that uh, your secure hardware is entirely separately managed from your main system. It has its own updates, and those updates are assigned with uh, their own signing key, and those signing keys are managed separately. And they have a few security mechanisms. If the phone is reset, the secure hardware will also be reset. So all I presented so far are uh, client-side available technologies. But if we want to solve the line private key backup problem, we need hardware-side uh, hardware uh, well, server-side solutions. So what kind of technologies are available on the server-side? There's three kinds of things available on the server-side. The first one is called a trusted execution environment. Uh, shortly, a trusted execution environment is a CPU-based software isolation. So the CPU is enforcing that this, uh, the creation of something called a secure world and the code running in the secure world is uh, isolated from the code in the normal world. And the secure world only uh, in the normal world cannot access the secure world code or memory. Uh, so there's a few implementation of this, this principle. Uh, Intel has Intel SGX, there is AMD PSP, and then there is ARM Trust Zone, used by Android phones. The second solution is what is known as a trusted platform module. Here, it's actually a separate hardware. It's a separate dedicated security chip that you often find on motherboards, and it's isolated from the main CPU and from the main memory. And it's often used uh, to implement things like secure boot, uh, fingerprint login, or even full disk encryption. You find that often on laptop, but it's also available on servers. Uh, the last solution is called uh, hardware security module. So here, instead of being on the same motherboard, it's actually completely disconnected hardware. Uh, so the, one of the advantages is that, uh, so it's one of the advantages that it's more isolated, so you have better security. But the other one is that it usually has some kind of cryptographic accelerator, uh, so it's actually faster than a TPM or a TE. And then it's connected to uh, a server either using a PCI Express or an Ethernet link. So currently at Line, we're exploring uh, solving this problem using HSMs because they offer more performance and more security. But this could be solved using uh, various solutions. Uh, so those are actually HSMs we have uh, in the data center at Line. Uh, so if you can see on the left, you have some kind of LCD screen with a management menu and then some buttons. So you actually have to physically operate this in data centers. And then in center, you have card slots uh, because to manage an HSM, you need special security cards, a bit like they look like banking cards. And then on the back, you have an Ethernet connector, a G45 connector, and you can connect that to uh, other servers. Now I will explain how we can try to solve uh, the secure backup problem using HSMs. The first thing we need is that we need some kind of secure channel between our user device and the HSMs. And we're going to reuse uh, what's used in letter sealing, and that's uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. So we're going to build a secure channel between the two. So, but here, uh, while the HSM has fixed key, we're going to use what is known as ephemeral key pairs on the client. So those ephemeral key pairs are only used once uh, for one connection and then are discarded after use. So again, same principle, uh, we're doing a key exchange and then from that key exchange, we are deriving an eph a shared key. But this one, it's an ephemeral shared key. Once we have that secure channel, if the user has some kind of private keys on his device, uh, then you can first you can first ask our user for a low entropy secret, like a pin. Uh, and then using that pin, we can encrypt uh, those private keys. But as I said, this is a very easy to brute force encryption. So we are now going to encrypt it a second time, with this time the ephemeral shared key, 
Uh, and so we end up with some kind of double encrypted payload uh, containing the private key. And this thing we can actually send through the network to the line servers. Then the, on the back of, on the HSM side, uh, they can retrieve uh, that double encrypted payload and because they have the ephemeral shared key, they can simply decrypt uh, the external encryption layer and get the pin encrypted uh, private keys, but only inside the HSMs. Now if a user wants to restore a backup, he first has to go over the ephemeral uh, key exchange uh, with this time a new ephemeral key pair. So this is actually a new ephemeral shared key. And again, we are going to ask our user for his low entropy secrets like his pin. And so we are going to encrypt this pin with the ephemeral shared key. We send that to line servers the backup HSM can retrieve it. And because the backup has the same ephemeral shared key, it can simply decrypt the pin. And now that we have the pin and the private key encrypted with the pin, we can attempt to decrypt uh, those private keys. So here, either the pin is valid and then the decryption works, or the pin is invalid and, and then the decryption doesn't work and we know about it. Now that if the description is valid, we have the private keys, but we cannot, cannot send those like this. So we're going to re-encrypt them with the ephemeral shared key and send that to the users via line servers. And the server and the client again has the same ephemeral shared key and can decrypt the private key and finally get access to his uh, private key. So uh, this, this scheme has a, a few properties that are important to note. The first one is that uh, the external encryption, the green one, is the one with the highest entropy possible because it's a key derived from a uh, secure EFI, uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman exchange. So an insider cannot brute force it. The next one is that uh, the client's uh, private key is an ephemeral key, so it's actually discarded after use. So nobody, it doesn't exist anymore. So the only way to decrypt uh, this thing is to have the HSM private key. But because the HSM is a private hardware, it actually enforces the fact that that key cannot be extracted out of the HSM or cloned, uh, even if you have a direct access to the HSM. Uh, oh, sorry. The last thing is that, uh, as I mentioned, the HSM can know if the pin uh, decryption attempt is valid or invalid. And a very nice thing about uh, HSMs is that you can write custom code that runs inside the HSM. And this code can actually do the pin decryption check. And from that, it can enforce something like a maximum failed attempt count or a timeout uh, if the user attempts too many logins. So even if you have access to the HSMs, you cannot brute force the pin using the HSMs because the HSMs will block you. So you might think that programming an HSM is a bit risky because uh, programming an HSM means that we have code now that has access to uh, the user pin, uh, to the private uh, pin encrypted private keys, uh, and in case of successful restore, has even access to the private keys themselves. Uh, that's why it's uh, very important to secure that process as well. So HSM actually have code signing. So uh, if you have your source code, you compile it first, and then you sign it uh, with the with the code signing private key, and you send the signed code to the HSM. And every time the HSM going, is going to run the code, it's first going to verify the signature of the code. So why is that important? Well. It's because uh, the HSM actually can bind the private key it's used for communication with user device with the code signing public key. Meaning that only a program signed with the correct code signing key can use the private key used to, access, to communicate with the users. So either you have the code signing private key to generate a valid signed binary that can communicate with the user, or you don't. And if you don't, even if you reset the code signing key, this new code signing key would not get access to the private key. So basically, we reduce the 
complexity and the security of the whole system into one problem, which is the secure management of the code signing private key. So there is a few ways to uh, solve that problem. The first way is that uh, it's a bit radical approach, but is you can physically destroy the code, uh, the code signing private key. Uh, this is because the code signing private key usually reside on some kind of, uh, a, like I say, smart card, like a banking card. And so you can simply blend it in a blender, and then nobody can use it. Uh, so if you want to enforce that, you, you want to make this process uh, auditable. So you usually organize something known as, an, as a key ceremony. So uh, it would be attended by multiple witnesses that watch all, all the operations. You can even go one step further and film the whole key ceremony so that it's verifiable after the fact. Uh, a less radical approach is to employ something known as uh, key sharding. So the idea is to split the key into multiple shards and you can have a model where you need n out of m shards. So that means if you have five shards, for example, distributed ac across five people, you need at least any three of those five shards to use the code signing key. So it means that if you you can basically delegate trust across employees. So you can give those shards across five employees and then an attacker would need to uh, compromise or have uh, you need have malicious people in at least three out of those five people. So that's what I wanted to talk about because I, I think this problem clearly demonstrates why uh, balancing UX and security is hard. Uh, it's not an easy task and not all our users are uh, advanced security experts and we cannot expect from them using secure passwords and things like that. And we want to make security usable every day uh, by everyday people. Uh, and as you can see, if you know cryptography, if you know how to use those advanced secure hardware, it can actually enable new compromise and get you out of situation that looks impossible at first sight. So the solution I talked about is not new at all. Uh, it's in fact used by the Apple uh, by Apple to secure uh, keychains. Uh, if you know the password keychains in, uh, in iOS, so that's why I mentioned that iMessage was one of the uh, messaging application that solved this problem. But it's also being developed by Google into a product known as Cloud Key Vault. So it's not something original and it's not something experimental. It's uh, actual real-world security. So at Line, we are currently experimenting with it, and we hope uh, that in the future we'll be able to uh, offer a similar service to our users to secure user backup and make phone migration easier. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be outside uh, for questions. <laughs>